Hello everyone and welcome back to ADAP, our course on advanced design and programming. So we are in the third part of three of this course now and in the previous lecture we discussed design patterns. In fact, arguably, before we even discussed design patterns we had already seen an important instance, the value object pattern. In today's lecture, I will continue uh, with this by introducing another important design pattern that has not been covered in the design patterns book that we discussed last time. The reason for me uh, for doing this is that the design patterns book is very well written and you can learn from it and that the patterns in it have been have broadly entered our vocabulary. This is not the case, sadly, with important design patterns like value object and today's topic type objects. So that is what I will be doing today. Introduce, uh, motivate and discuss uh, the type object pattern, give you a fair number of examples and focus on how you can use at the end uh, how you can use the type object pattern or it's a basic building block of so-called meta-level architectures. So let's get started. First we need to understand the difference between design time and runtime. It should come easy to you. As you're developing software, now uh, you're uh, being social with your colleagues, but in the end you will be sitting in front of a computer and you will be typing program code at some point of time. So that is when you are designing and editing. And that's when you're going through edit, compile, build and test a locally cycle. So that is the design time, the creative process of where you design and program the software. In a somewhat professional setup, you have a separate test system through which you run your software and if it passes all tests, you'll put things into production. Production is where the real runtime happens, meaning now the system is being used to the fullest and you are not there. It's the system, arguably your code, left to its own devices and all that can change the system now uh, is itself and that is the runtime. If you're picky you can argue the runtime is everywhere as you are running tests all the time which is correct so you're executing you're running your software all the time but the real proof of the pudding of course is when the system is in production and that's what we usually mean by the main uh, runtime and during design time, you can change your object-oriented classes by programming new or different code, but at runtime, you're not there and you can't do that. And at best, if that would pos is possible, sometimes it is, sometimes it's not, the system would be programming itself. So the challenge now is, if you are not there during runtime, what flexibility is left for the system itself to cope with complex situations during runtime. So let's use a domain example. So let's assume you're a streaming service, streaming movies to your customers. And so you've got to have an inventory of all the movies that are out there and that your users or customers might want to stream. So in a very naive approach, you would be modeling a movie class hierarchy or some abstract class movie and then maybe you have categories like action movie or romantic movie or comedy and then you have maybe the specific movies as subclasses. And if you are streaming or if some user asks to watch uh, Pretty Woman, then uh, you will instantiate that class and that becomes the streaming instance where Pretty Woman was, was streamed to and viewed by user XYZ. So for each streaming occasion or event you instantiate the class and you know the class so you know what movie it is that the users were watching. Uh, it should be obvious that this is not a scalable solution because again this is design time. 
but you don't want to add another object-oriented subclass for each new movie that comes out. You would be continuously updating this system by writing new movie subclasses um, and it would just grow and it would just get really large and unwieldy, not to mention that you have to, to update your streaming system all the time for uh, a reason that can actually be handled uh, in a different way. And so maybe you already had a different design in mind, something like this here, where you do not create a large class hierarchy of movie classes, uh, but rather simply have one movie class and a separate class for the instances, the streaming instances or the copies, if this was still uh, the old blockbuster movie rental. So you separate the description of what the movie is from streaming or showing or viewing uh, the movie and you may turn it into two separate classes. The movie class then has the information about the movie that is uh, just about the movie and would obviously be common to all the instances. What's the title of the movie? Who was the director? When was it released? Etc. And the uh, instance class would have attributes for when was the movie streamed, uh, by who, and so forth. And then you would have an n one-to-n -n relationship between the movie and the n many uh, instances of streaming that movie. And in runtime, so not a design time, but at runtime now, you get these get a set of objects that might look like this. You have the three movie objects. In this example, you have three movie objects. Uh, one for Die Hard, one for Die 2, and one for Love, actually. It's three separate movies, which all get streamed once in a while or very often, depending uh, on maybe the seasons. And uh, here, coincidentally, each movie has three st streaming instances shown. So, at the top are the movies and at the bottom are the streaming instances or movie copies here. There's a big bar in the middle, model versus instance, uh, only serves to illustrate that we are talking about these two types of objects, the model or type objects as we will so soon learn, and the instance objects, which are the instances of the type objects. And it's already perhaps apparent that there will be many more instances than uh, model or type objects. But with this model, as illustrated here, for each new movie, you just need to create a new object at runtime, a new movie object like Die Hard 25. And then you can, after you created that object, you can start creating movie copy objects for all the streaming instances of that particular movie. So the system has become extensible at a runtime, where in the original design, not a very good design, but maybe the naive direct design one would think of, you would have to program a new class for Die Hard 25 or something. So as already indicated, underlying this second better runtime design is the so-called type object pattern. That's a design pattern and it has the following intent to separate or decouple the instances of classes from these classes so that you can, can turn those classes into objects itself. Meaning these classes are class objects that are themselves runtime objects of some other class. And that other class would be the type object class. Type object uh, therefore allows new classes to be created dynamically. We are just instantiating the type object class to get a new class object object. And uh, with that, you have your own type checking system possibly. So you can have all kinds of rules, what makes a valid type, and you can instantiate more types. You can grow a type hierarchy, class hierarchy, and so forth. And it leads to much less classes that you would otherwise have to hand program and therefore makes your system uh, smaller and simpler. So here's the uh, 
uh, illustrating diagram or the structure. And it's really that simple. Uh, simply not just one big class hierarchy, but just one class, the object type here, class, of which the instances are type objects. And then the instance class uh, called object here, which are the instances of the type objects. And so when you instantiate these classes uh, for instances from the class on the left, you get type objects. And for instances from instantiating the class on the right, you get the instance objects. And from each instance object, you have a link to uh, usually one type object that is its type and where you might provide some type checking or validity checking uh, rules. And then on the other direction for each type object, an instance from the class on the left, for each type object, you might have many instances as objects that are instances of the object class here to the right. So it's a one on the left and n or many on the right in terms of objects when you instantiate this model. So the object class has the instance specific functionality and whatever is type relevant, like type checking or validity checking or validation is delegated to the type object. And the type object class is called object type here, and that's where all the type specific, but not instance specific information is. This uh, includes all the relevant typing information. So is a particular object a valid instance of this type? Or uh, create a new instance of this type that conforms to its rules and so forth. This really reduces a possibly exploding class hierarchy to just these two classes. And if you ever face such an exploding class hierarchy, type object is the place or solution to go to. In addition, well, you can not own, well, that's, that's a corollary. You can create new classes, new types at runtime. So even if your system is already in production, you don't have to uh, start programming again. You just create new objects for new types. The downside, of course, is that when you look at the code, so back to design time, when you look at the code, um, you don't see your big class hierarchy. There is no class die hard or love actually any longer. It only exists at runtime as an object, so it becomes data in a database from which the type object for the movie Die Hard or Love actually is loaded. So you can't inspect it at a design time. If anything, you have to use specialized tool, tools or a database browser to browse the data or use the debugger at runtime uh, to find the object. So that makes understanding the system harder because it's less obvious and makes debugging it more difficult because more things are in the data rather than in code, and data is usually harder to read than code. Despite these challenges, type object is, as they say, totally worth it. So here are some examples to illustrate that. It's baked into Java and most other programming language at the core in some form. Uh, in Java it's actually pretty shallow but it's still there and the class java.lang.object is the object class to its type object class java.lang.class. For each object in the system there is another object which serves as its class object from which you can get the typing information about its instances. And that's at the core of the system. It's even recursive. So for a given class object, you can ask it for its class object, uh, which would be the matter class. And hence, you have a nice self-descriptive system. It is limited in what it can do because it only lets you look at things. It doesn't let you change things. And we'll get to that later. In Wildsight, um, or in my example uh, application of Wildside, um, in the flowers application, I will introduce now the idea that flowers can be of certain types. And hence, because there are a lot of different types of flowers, 
you want to model that using type object. So you introduce a flower class for the instance, a particular rose in a particular uh, flower bed or on your balcony. And then separately, the flower type itself, rose, independent of uh, how many there are and where they are, or where they all are. Um, yet another example are person roles and person role types um, in, in a banking system or in authentication, authorization, identity management system. You would want to define the roles that people can play. Uh, that would be the role types, and then allocate different person role instances to different uh, different people with uh, varying parameters as they become an administrator or as they become a moderator or and so forth. So here's a simple quiz. Um, yet another example of the type object pattern. You're developing software for configuring computers. Imagine you're running the shop which provides customized gaming machines to gamers. And so gamers come in and say, I want this, I want that. Does that work together? And please sell it to me. So let's assume uh, you need a particular keyboard or you know that your customers want varying keyboards and there are so many keyboards, types of keyboards out there. So you use the type object pattern to have a keyboard class um, in Java, uh, which would be the instances. So the keyboard one, two, three is sold to customer ABC. But then you introduce a class keyboard type using the type object pattern to capture the model and make of that. So a cherry or a razor or I don't know what types of keyboards there are. So there are a couple of design decisions to make now. Which of these four are good design decisions? Give the keyboard class two attributes, model and make. Give the keyword type class, these attributes, model and make. So where does model and make belong if you name it like cherry, so and so? How do you structure the relationship? Does the keyboard class get a reference to its type class so that its instances can link back to a type object? And do you give the type object a collection of references to its instances at runtime? These are the uh, four possible design options I'm suggesting here. Which of these are good design decisions? Huh? Think about it. Ding, 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 ding. All right, let me tell you what I'm thinking. The model and make attribute belong to the keyboard type class. You know, conceivably, it's more elaborate than just two strings, but it's clearly type level information. So it does not belong into the keyboard class. It belongs into the type object class called keyboard type here. So if the model is cherry, uh, then that string belongs to the keyboard type class. So the, the attribute model belongs to the keyboard type class so that its instances would be cherry keyboards. Uh, of which then again there can be uh, many instances uh, with different serial numbers for the different specific physical keyboards that are sold to customers. And then um, I think that uh, it's common practice that the instance, meaning an instance of the keyboard class, has a link back to its type object so that the instance can ask its type object about, am I, a am I in good standing? Am I a valid object? So it's commonly done in such a way that simply the keyboard class defines an attribute that's the reference to the keyboard type class. So if a uh, field uh, keyboard type, uh, my type. And that's the easiest way to access the, uh, the type object. You could of course maintain the link to the type outside of the keyboard class, maybe in some separate map, but uh, usually you just put it right into the instance object. The other direction makes less sense because 
lugging around, moving around a large collection of instances, maintaining that uh, in the type object often doesn't make sense. Um, usually you go from instance to type, you rarely go from type to all instances, though that may happen, and if you need it, you usually uh, have a different solution to finding about, out about the instances rather than having large collections in each type object. So hence, it depends, but in general, the uh, keyboard type class does not define a collection as an attribute, uh, a collection of its instance objects. When we apply it to flowers, it would look like this. We still have our flower photo class on the left. And now we introduce or have introduced the flower class. So the photo of a flower is separate from the actual flower. And because the flower photo could be taken on a particular date and there could be multiple photos of essentially the same flower in my flower bed, maybe I have my favorite tulip there and I always photograph that particular tulip. And so I separate out photo from flower. But now I want to use the type object pattern to model the domain information I have about my flowers. Maybe because I want to search for different types of flowers. Show me all my tulip photos versus show me all my rose photos. So I now have a flower type class, which is the type object class, uh, separate from the flower class, which is the instance class. And hence I have a link from the flower class to the flower type class, and maybe I have a collection, but usually I don't recommend that on a Java implementation level, as I just said, of a collection of the instances uh, going from flower type to flower. And both of these, the type and the instances, are managed by a flower manager here. Creating a flower becomes simple then. You will still use the flower manager. And what we need is to know first what type of flower do we want to create. So we're simplifying here and just use a string as the name. So when you look at it then, you can see how flower type first asks for, asks for, um, how the flower manager first asks for the flower type that corresponds to the provided type name. Um, then they ask it to create an instance. So the flower type class, the type object class, has, an inst has a method called create instance. It's very simple because we do not, in this case, we don't have specialized classes. We just generically instantiate the flower uh, class, the instance class, uh, but tell it that this flower type object is its type. So that's why in the method for create instance, you can see new flower with this, meaning the type object. And now the new instance knows what its type is, even though it's just a gen object of a generic flower class. It is uh, not just any flower, but it has this runtime type represented by the flower type object. And so the flower class in its constructor where it receives the flower type object just saves the flower type object. So that was very basic. Let's look at some things now that we can build from this. A simple next step is type hierarchies. Like you have class hierarchies, maybe you want type object hierarchies. Really, the, the use of the word type here and type object is just so that you can use these words independently of classes, so that when maybe you discuss it with colleagues, when you say class, everyone knows you're talking about Java classes, while when you're talking, when, we, while when you're using type object, people know you're talking about runtime objects. So we can now have a type object hierarchy that is effectively a type hierarchy at runtime. We can even build it at runtime. How might this look? So why is that necessary and how might it look like? Going back to my flowers, 
the motivation is straightforward. There are a gazillion of flower types. There's not just rows and tulips, there are just constantly new types of flowers being created and invented, not to mention that the existing fauna, well, flora in this case, um, is actually uh, very rich already. Mm, biology gives us a pretty nice, uh, nice classification already. It's, as far as I know, even a single inheritance classification, meaning it uh, does not use multiple inheritance. Each type has exactly one supertype, not many. And to model that, we now enhance our type object with ta -da, a link from each type object to its supertype. And also possibly from each supertype back to all its subtype objects. So you can see the link here. Uh, the class flower type defines the reference uh, um, to its supertype, which is of its own class. And the subtypes are also um, uh, go the other way. This is just a tree structure. It's a one to n parent child relationship could even almost have used the composite pattern here if you felt a need to distinguish between some sort of root flower type and leaf flower types. We'll keep it simple. It's just node which has subnodes or in this case flower type which has subflower types. And so at runtime, you instantiate flower type and you link it in a certain way that it becomes a single, becomes a tree that represents a single inheritance type object hierarchy of flower types. And the object names are generic because it's all instances of flower type, but in the name, again, that's a simplification if this was a real system, but it's good enough here. In the name string, you actually name what real world flower things correspond to. And that involves abstract types. So we start with flower, that's the root, obviously an abstract flower type object because there is any specific flower in the real world is of a specific type, not just flower. Same thing with rose and lily and tulip, that's too abstract. But then there are subtypes, and this is a really incomplete biological hierarchy, but that just serves demonstration purposes. But then there are specific, and let's assume they are concrete and no further subtypes available. There are specific flower types, subtypes of the rose category or rose type called Peace, Queen Elizabeth and Fragrant Cloud. And of these then, there can be instances the specific flowers on my balcony or in my garden. And again, those above this bold line, these are the type objects, which now look a bit more complicated given that we have a single inheritance type object hierarchy here. And below the bar are the instances. But don't be misled by that. You will still have instances aplenty, even if we are focusing on the model right now which now is not just a set of unrelated type objects, but becomes really a model of interlinked type object that describe the domain. How would you implement it? This is uh, pointing towards your upcoming homework. Well, you would have the flower type object um, hold a link uh, hold, have the client define a ref, have the class define a reference to its supertype, have the class define a collection of its subtypes, and then have the appropriate methods to add a subtype, change the supertype, and so forth. It's pretty straightforward composite or tree structure uh, implementation here that by now you should have seen. Uh, many times just applied to different examples. Um, with the type object now, um, 
at hand, you can add additional functionality. Here's an, inst here's an example of a reasonable function that uh, you might want. For example, does um, this type of flower or is a given flower an instance of this particular type? We can come both ways here. I'm looking at the flower type class. I can ask a type object, is this flower an instance of yours? And in general, that is pretty simple, you would think, because you just compare the flower type object that is being asked with the type object that has been set to the flower. And if it's the same, then obviously it is an instance. But now that we introduced subtypes and have a tree structure or an inheritance hierarchy of type objects we also have to traverse the uh, have to traverse the subtypes so in this code here you can see the check whether the flower is an instance of this very flower type object that's being asked and then if not uh, this flower type object asks its subtypes whether this particular flower is an instance of those. So it basically traverses into the tree structure. This is a um, uh, um, depth first traversal, but it doesn't matter because you don't know where the match will happen anyway. So breadth first, depth first, it doesn't matter. Here is another example, the one you can look up in your JDK. So we are back to java.lang.object and java.lang.class. In real life, meaning in real systems, which are on toy systems for teaching purposes, uh, like the JDK, you can see it gets complicated. This is the set of methods on class. So the java.lang.class class defines all the methods that you can ask a class object about its instances and about related classes and so forth. Mostly the class object will provide you with information what fields, what methods, etc. its instances can have. Um, it provides some functionality for in inspecting or looking at the attributes uh, of some instances, but it does not really provide you with functionality to change those. So you can look at things, you can even break encapsulation or in a, some way um, circumvent encapsulation and look at content, but you can't actually change it. But when you look at this long list of methods, uh, there's a fair, it's a whole potpourri of things to choose from. As you hold a generic object, you don't know much about it. What you know about it is by calling get class. You will get to its class object, and then you can start bothering the class objects about all the attributes and methods that this generic object you're holding um, has. You may want to start with the name of the class and then the attributes and methods that, the, uh, that it defines for its instances of which the object you just asked about its class is one of. So I already gave you an idea of something called a model and um, where a model is more than just unrelated type objects but really type objects and how they're interlinked and how they would describe a domain. And that really is where something called meta object protocols uh, shine. How do you build these models? How do you rep represent them? So let's get started by a really simple system which can describe itself. So you can have a model of the system at runtime and it might look like this. We know we have objects and values. That's a fundamental modeling decision we make. So 
for objects and values, which are the instances, there must be describing type objects. So we have an object type and a value type class. They are both types and they both have attributes. So we introduce a type superclass for object type and value type, which can hold attributes or which defines attributes of which then the instances, instances of object and value can have also instances that conform to it. So a value uh, might not only now ask its type object, what's my name, am I in valid status, but it might also ask, is this a valid attribute that can be set to me using a generic key value pair function, for example, and so forth. So the very basic objects and values uh, which can have attributes. Um, but you can turn that system into something real very quickly. For example, here you have um, a model of a financial system or some small aspect of it where you're representing the for a foreign currency account of John Doe. John Doe here um, holds an account that can have owns an account that can have foreign currency and I'm making a Chinese renminbi here. So you could program hard classes or you know that you have lots of customers and lots of different financial products. The foreign currency account is only one and hence you might want to use a meta modeling or a meta object approach to it where you know the actual payload data is the foreign currency account called object 363334, which has a balance uh, of 1024 renminbi and has an owner called John Doe. Now you really want to make sure these objects are valid in that they match the domain semantics, which is why you have that type level or model level here in which you represent the information you know about what makes a valid model. So that um, the foreign currency account must have an owner and must have a balance and that must be of type monetary amount and so forth and then you can use this very simple admittedly but you can use this model to type check that this combination of instance objects is actually valid and while it may lead to a so what reaction when you maybe see it for the first time just imagine again there are lots of types of financial products in this domain being invented all the time they actually are and you don't want to shut down and update the system all the time. So uh, going back here, um, when you talk about these types of systems, you talk about different types of objects. We have the instance objects, but instance is a relative term. So when we talk about instance and type, that is the roles these two objects, the type object and the instance object uh, play in relation to each other. As already mentioned, java.lang.class is has a class object itself. So from any arbitrary object in Java that is not a class object, you can go to its class object. And that class object, you can also ask, give me my class object, which is the widely shared java.lang.class class object. So uh, that class object as its instance has other instances has other class objects and that's why it's called meta class object. So these are the three basic levels of objects you can have. The general instance objects that are not type objects of anything. The class or type objects that are the type objects of those instance objects that are not type objects. And then the type objects or meta class objects that are the type objects of other type objects. And this constitutes three modeling level, often called M0, M1, M2, at least in UML, to which we'll come later. And this also corresponds to the observation that the objects, the plane objects, are the instances, 
uh, this is the instance level, the regular class or type objects are the model level, and here it comes, the meta objects are the language level. So you use meta objects like the meta, like the meta class as a way of expressing, expressing models. You're using the language to describe models and then you're instantiating the models to get at runtime something uh, that conforms to this model. And in some sense I misspoke because all of this is runtime and you can have the meta classes, the language and the model, then the classes, the model and the instances, the instance of, of the model all at runtime in some languages. So you can even have meta classes changed and extended meaning change the programming language and runtime in some systems. So again, meta object and base objects, that's the same as type object and instance object. These are relative terms defining the roles in relation to each other. And this role relationship is usually that for a given instance object, you can find its type object and for a given type object, you can go to the instances of it. When you have a system, that works based on this model, you have two levels of functionality. The simple one, like in Java, is that you can have introspection, where introspection means you can use the meta object protocol, that's the term now, the function say on the class, class, where you can use the meta object protocol to look at the structure and content of your system. So you're inspecting the system, you're not changing it. If your meta object protocol also contains functionality to not only inspect things, but also change them, then we are talking about intercession, the ability to manipulate the structure and content and thereby also the behavior of the objects uh, under the meta object protocol. And in Java, you have introspection, but no intercession. And say in CLOS, the common lisp object system, you have both introspection and intercession. And that is very powerful because now you can build your domain specific languages or just languages at runtime and uh, enhance the system and its expressiveness uh, all by itself. The most common or most widely used way how meta object protocols, even though not necessarily understood like this, have made it into the mainstream, into mainstream software engineering is by way of UML. UML is a modeling language and therefore gives us meta objects. It is the M2 level where UML gives us the concepts like class and classifier as a standalone concept, not a standalone concept, it's uh, interlinked with a lot of things, but it is a meta model concept classifier here and subclass class and so forth. And you can see here all the interactions. So UML in some sense is not just some specification, it is its own system, so there are libraries that reify, turn into objects, the concepts from UML like classifier and type and substitution and use case and generalization, turn these into objects. And these are the meta objects on the meta model level, which you would instantiate if you wanted to uh, create a model. For example, if you are designing uh, modeling tool, a graphic modeling tool for UML diagrams, you would have to create, um, you would have to use these classes and most likely turn them into type objects so that you can instantiate them most easily and create uh, instances of it, which would be your model of, the of a system you might be designing. So when you look at this again, this whole complexity is here because it is a real a solution to what people need in practice and that's why it has become so elaborate. 
to the extent that some people don't like it any longer because it's so elaborate, but that's complexity that happens in the real world. So let's let's align these things or correlate these things. Um, we now have a conceptual approach to modeling where we know we can distinguish between uh, the instances, objects that are not type objects of anything, and that's the M0 level or the runtime or instances level. We can then talk about the M1 level, which is the model of the instances. So this is the regular classes in Java or the type objects at runtime. And then we have the M2 level, which is the languages level or meta uh, model or meta object level, meta class level, um, where we would have the modeling concepts. That would be the classifier, or the generalization concept from UML, but it's also the Java uh, programming language elements like, like uh, classes and keywords and so forth. And most importantly, the separation of M0, M1, M2 are a logical separation, which sometimes is a hard separation in your work because one thing is what you type into your editor and another thing is what happens in runtime. But in some systems, it can all take place at runtime. So it's really just all objects at runtime. And you look at this sea of objects and you say, oh, these are the instances, these are the M0 level objects, and here are the type objects, these are the model level, M1 level objects, and wow, here are our language level objects, uh, the M2 level objects, and then you can see how the instances of the M2 level objects are the objects from the M1 level, and the instances of the M1 level objects are the M0 level objects. And uh, you can see that illustrated in this table here. I call it static if it's kind of built into your development rhythm and the tools you use and so forth. So from each level to the next higher, from M0 to M1, where there's a type instance relationship, you kind of change the modality of working with it. One is what you type in your editor and the other thing is what you happens at runtime. And from M1 to M2 is how the language designers write the compilers that you use and editors that you later use. So that's another type instance relationship handled by someone completely else. And that is static in the sense of that doesn't change quickly. But it could. It could change quickly if it was all objects at runtime. So you could have purely in the M0 level all of this turned by 90 degrees and mapped into the M0 level. If you took the UML specification and took every concept and turned it into an object and wrote the appropriate infrastructure for it, then you could at runtime take an M2 object like uh, M2 level object like classifier and create an instance of it, which would be flower, um, the flower class. And then of course you could create a further instance of that flower class and it would be flower one, two, three in the bed, flower bed, or on my balcony. And you could have all of that at runtime. That would be, or that is, the ultimate extensible system because everything can happen at runtime now. And you never have to restart the system or uh, switch back to your editor and go through an edit, compile, build, and deploy cycle. Whether you want that, whether the task at hand warrants this complexity that you're getting as you move everything into runtime depends depends on what you're trying to achieve and i think that's it from me for today so that was a tour de force uh, par force writ, <laughs> ride uh, through the type object pattern how we have to distinguish between design time and runtime, do that naturally because that's how we learn to program, but may not always want to separate out things, in particular not if things keep changing quickly in the domain and if we don't want to shut systems down but want to be able to extend them at runtime, where systems either do that themselves or they do it based on your user input, for which you need the type object pattern. 
And the type object pattern really is just the most basic building block of model-driven systems or meta object protocols or UML-based modeling systems. And so I hope I could convey some of that to you. This is practical. We use this, my research group uses this in its daily work. For example, in the JValue project, we are modeling data schemata uh, based on this distinction. So if it tickles your interest, if that intellectual horsepower you need to bring to bear on this problem, uh, if that's you, come talk to us and we might have good student jobs for you. Thank you for your time and attention and see you in the next session.